I met Sojourner Truth. Hopefully today through this service and the message, you'll feel like you meet her. Our scripture for today is Galatians 3, verse 23 to 29. These were some verses that Sojourner Truth liked to preach on. She liked to read them at, at gatherings where she would communicate. Listen as God speaks, only through Sojourner Truth's words, but through these words of the Apostle Paul through the, to the church at Galatia. Now, before faith came, we were in prison and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinarian until Christ came so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinarian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all, you are all, you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Oh God, may the words of Sojourner Truth inspire us, and may these words of Scripture inspire us, so that we may hear your voice. And may we not only be meeting Sojourner Truth in this message, but may we meet you, O oh God, through Jesus Christ. For it is in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we pray, and may all God's people say, Amen. This poem by the poet and contemporary of Sojourner Truth, a man named Edwin Markham, set the tone for our message today. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him or her in. Lines tell us a lot about life, don't they? Lines tell us what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. Lines tell us who's in bounds and what's out of bounds. In today's Super Bowl game, this afternoon over here, not far from here in Los Angeles, there's going to be a lot of lines on the field when the Cincinnati Bengals play our Los Angeles Rams. Let me say that one more time. When the Cincinnati Bengals play our Los Angeles Rams. There's going to be a lot of lines on the field. There's a goal line, and there's a 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, midfield, 45, 40, 35, 30. You get the idea. There's a lot of lines on the field. But two of the most important lines are the boundary lines, those, those side lines. Because if a football player touches that line with the ball, he's out of bounds. That's why when some players catch the ball right before they go out of bounds, they make sure they've got two feet in. They can lean over the line, and they can put their head over the line, and their hands over the line, and their torso over the line, but their feet can't touch that line. The feet have got to be in bounds. That's why they have the replay to show where the feet really in bounds. If you touch that line, you're out of bounds. Now, here's what's confusing about boundary lines. In baseball, what happens? When a Los Angeles Dodger hits a streaming line drive down the left field line, and when it touches the left field line, is it fair or foul? Fair. It's fair. So in baseball, if the ball hits the line, it's inbounds. In football, if you touch the line, it's out of bounds. So who makes the rules anyway? Who makes these rules about lines anyway? Where do they come from? Well, there's a National Football League that makes the rules, and there's a commissioner and a league officers and board of trustees, and they make the rules that if you touch that line, you're out of bounds. But Major League Baseball has a commissioner, and their board of trustees have said, if the ball hits the line, it's inbounds. Our son Toby worked some years ago for the National Football League on Park Avenue in New York City. I was a pastor in New York City, and, and one of the members of the National Football League, a, who was director of communications, said to me one time, Tom, we've got a job opening this summer for a summer intern with your son Toby, like a job at the National Football League. I said, who cares about Toby? I'd like a job at the National <laughs> Football League. <laughs> 
He said, no, no, I'd like Toby to have it. Anyway, Toby got that job. And you know what was so fun? I used to love calling, calling there in the morning, and they would say, good morning, National Football League. I said, yes, I'd like to speak to Toby Tool, please. They said, oh, yes, just a moment. We'll try Mr. Tool's extension. I could live on that for a whole week, just hearing that. <laughs> but Toby was in the league office where the rules were made. Now, who determines whether you're inbounds or out of bounds in the game of life? See, we as followers of Jesus Christ have a different philosophy of life. We believe that God Almighty determines who's inbounds and who's out of bounds, what's inbounds and what's out of bounds. And believe me, God's value system of what's inbounds and what's out of bounds is very different from society's view of what's inbounds and what's out of bounds. This morning, we look at a woman who's, during the time in which she lived, there are a lot of things that were inbounds that God Almighty said are out of bounds. Her name was Isabella van Wegenen. She was a Dutch reformer. She was a Dutch person, a slave born into a Dutch family in upstate New York in Ulster County. Isabella van Wegenen, she was Dutch, and she learned to speak Dutch, actually. But it's interesting that they called her Isabella bomb free because in Dutch, the word bomb free means tall. And her father, James, was a very tall man, and she was very tall. So she got this nickname, Isabella bomb free, because she was tall, and she stood up straight and tall. But in the time in which Isabella lived, many things were inbounds that God clearly said are out of bounds. Slavery was inbounds, not out of bounds. And you could be a respectable person and a leader in the community and thought to be a person of integrity and you could own slaves. That was inbounds. Not only that, but a slave was thought of as three-fifths of a person. So when Isabella Bomfrey or Isabella Van Wegenen was born, nobody knew the exact date because they didn't give slaves birth certificates. They didn't give people born into slavery a registration that they were even born. So nobody actually knows the date in which she was born, exactly where she was born. They think it might have been 1797, 1798, 1799, but nobody knew because it was in bounds to think that a slave was three-fifths of a person. I hate to bring this up, but abuse was in bounds. Verbal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. You might call it rape. They just said it was in bounds. It was part of the game. The church, I hate to bring this up too, condoned slavery. Well, they didn't come right out and say it, but they acted as if they condoned it. When Christian people went to the slave market representing the church, and the slaves were sold, and the proceeds from the sale of slaves went, where do you hear this, to the education of clergy for the ministry. The education of the slaves was taken, given to the church, and went to divinity schools and theological schools so, so young men could be trained to go into the ministry. And that was all condoned by slavery. So in the time in which Isabella Bomfrey lived, all of this was in bounds. And then it happened. It happened. Isabella met Jesus. And when she met Jesus, her whole world changed. She went to a, an event one evening. And a man was preaching. And the sermon was called Five Minutes to Midnight. And he was saying, at midnight, Jesus Christ is coming back. And it's five minutes to midnight. Are you ready to meet Jesus? It's five minutes to midnight, four minutes to midnight, three minutes to midnight. He had the countdown. And then every time he would say, are you ready to meet Jesus? And people would stand and say, yes, I'm ready. Yes, I'm ready. And Isabella hadn't stood yet. And finally, at a minute or two before midnight, Isabella said, yes, yes, I'm ready. I received Jesus into my life. See, society drew a circle that shut her out, heretic rebel, a thing to flout. But God and Jesus had the wit to win. They drew a circle that took a young black slave woman, born Isabel Van Wegenen, and became Isabel Bonfrey. They drew a circle that took her in, and she realized God was for her. Think about those words. God was for her. 
And so she gave her life to Jesus, not just a commitment, not just saying, I believe in Jesus Christ, but saying, I give my whole life to Jesus. Isabella had rage at her slave owners, rage at the people who had abused her and not taken care of her and allowed her to grow up illiterate, not really knowing how to read or write. She had rage against them. But when she met Jesus, she, she gave that rage to God. She, she was angry. She told God how angry she was. And slowly over time, God healed her of that. She became a Pentecostal and God cast out the demons of anger and all these things within her, racism in her that she said against white people. And she became a new creation, a new person. And, and when she did, three things happened to her. One is she ran away from being a slave. She left her place in up New York State in the middle of the night, and she ran all the way to New York City, staying where she could, hiding out, realizing if she'd been caught, she'd have been killed. But she just hid out as she could. She went to New York City, and she found people who actually, some were slave owners in New York City, but there were many who weren't, and many had sympathy to somebody who'd been a slave, and people took her in. White people took her in. African-American people took her in. People who'd been slaves took her in, and she made a living. She was able to work and to, to clean and to, to, to plant and to work in kitchens and to, to clean restrooms and all kinds of things, but she made some money, and during that time, she embraced herself and immersed herself in the Pentecostal community and the Methodist church where Methodists believe in perfectionism, sanctification. She wanted to become more and more like Jesus. And she developed this phenomenal prayer life where she talked to God. Now, here's the thing. She couldn't read or write, but she talked to God, and she heard this voice. And as she heard this voice, she realized, that is God speaking to me, and it's the truth. And she embraced it, and she gave her life to it. And she heard this voice. So the first thing she did was she ran away from, from being a slave when she met Jesus. The second thing she did was she came to the realization that all the things that society said were in bounds were really out of bounds. She came to the realization and she internalized it as truth that slavery was out of bounds and abuse was out of bounds. And categorizing somebody because they were, uh, because of the color of their skin is out of bounds. And characterizing somebody because of their gender is out of bounds. And she realized all those things that she thought were in bounds, that she'd been taught were in bounds, that she experienced were in bounds, she realized that's all out of bounds and it changed her life. And the third thing that happened is she changed her name. She decided to let that voice that spoke to her, that was always with her, that was with her in the kitchen, whether she was in the restroom, whether she was out in the field, wherever she was, that voice that was always with her, she realized that voice was God, and that was her vocare, vocation, comes from the word voice, and she gave herself a name that really embodied her vocation, her, the voice of God she heard, and the name she chose was Sojourner. She was on a journey, a sojourn after God, and God's on the move. God's always doing something. God loves us as we are, but doesn't leave us where we are, and God had her on a sojourn. And then she took the name Truth as a last name to say, I hear this voice of God, and I'm going to believe that it is true, and I'm going to speak the truth no matter what. Now, when she spoke the word truth, what's so interesting about the word truth is she heard this scripture that was read to her, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And people, when they heard that verse, they'd often say, well, know the truth. What is the truth? And she realized the truth wasn't out there somewhere. The truth was Jesus, and Jesus is in here. And she realized that sojourner truth, that God had given her the truth and had put the truth within her. So where did she discover all this? Well, from the Bible, but I thought you said she couldn't read. She couldn't read. She couldn't write. But she heard Scripture. And as a result, you know sometimes when you hear something and you don't write it down, you can't read it? She actually internalized it. She memorized it, and she internalized it. So later on when she spoke, she knew the Scripture by heart. These verses, there's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free nor male or female. She knew it by heart. She had internalized it. She internalized, nothing can ever separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. She internalized all this stuff. And people read the scripture to her. And you know who she wanted most of all to read the scripture to her? Children. Because they didn't comment on it. 
They didn't give her a commentary on what it meant. They just read the scripture to her over and over and over again, and she got it. And she discovered this voice, this truth, sojourner truth. She discovered her voice, but she had to learn to trust the voice in New York City. So she went one night to hear one of the greatest orators in the world at that time, Frederick Douglass. And he's up on the stage and he's speaking and he was a phenomenal orator and she was this little woman in the front row. She was sitting there. She was invited to be in the front row though. And she sat there and Frederick Douglass was mad. He, he got mad, this black Frederick Douglass. He didn't know how slavery was gonna end and he was berating the people and saying to them, you know, we've gotta end slavery but, but you don't have the courage to end slavery and I don't have the courage to do it. So the people who've gotta do it are the slaves themselves. They've gotta actually come out and they've gotta be violent against the white people and you have gotta be violent against your masters and you've gotta treat them the way they treat you. And somehow it didn't ring true to Sojourner Truth. Somehow she felt like Frederick Douglass, this brilliant guy, this well-educated person, this orator, spoke all over America, that he didn't get it, that he had left God out of the equation. And when, when he finished, Douglass thought he was going to get a standing ovation, and instead nobody spoke at all. There was hushed silence. But Sojourner Truth was in the front row when Douglass came down from the podium. She said in a loud enough voice that everybody in the room could hear, she said, Frederick, is God dead? And people started to laugh. And then they started to murmur. And then they started to applaud. And then they stood and applauded because people realized that woman, that this, this little woman, a former slave, she was the orator. She spoke the truth. Is God dead? No, God's not dead. Don't leave God out of the equation. It's all, we gotta protest, we gotta talk, speak up, we gotta use our voice, but we've also gotta bring God into the equation. That was the truth for her. Sojourner Truth had a self-esteem that no other person who endured slavery ever had. No other woman who ever endured the ordeals of slavery ever became a public figure to the extent that Sojourner Truth did. Harriet Tubman, just after Sojourner Truth, was well-known and well-loved, but, but she never quite had the following that Sojourner had. And that self-esteem that Sojourner Truth had, it was from the Holy Spirit. She believed she was a child of God. And Sojourner discovered her lane, her lane for speaking. She would often say, among blacks, there are women. And among women, there are blacks. And people wondered what she talking about. Well, among blacks, there are women. When people thought of black slaves, they thought of men. And when people thought of women, they thought of white women. So she had two strikes against her. She was a black woman, and she was a woman, not a white woman, she was a black woman. She had these two strikes against her, but she realized instead of that being a negative, it was a positive. That was her lane. So in addition to speaking about Jesus and evangelism, she spoke about women's suffrage and ending slavery. That was her lane. And her name was Sojourner. She was on this incredible journey, and God was leading her all over America to speak. But how would a black slave woman get invited to speak places? Well, it's interesting. Harriet Beecher Stowe heard her. Harriet Beecher Stowe got to know her, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. And Harriet Beecher Stowe stood up and used her voice. She was the, one of the leading authors in the whole nation at that time. And when she spoke and when she wrote, everybody couldn't get enough of her. But when Harriet Beecher Stowe said, you know, this Sojourner Truth, she's the real deal. And then when other women started to say, she's the real deal, other people started to perk up and they took notice of Sojourner Truth. So she was invited to Long Island and Rhode Island and Northampton, Massachusetts and Akron, Ohio, where she gave the a I a woman speech. And she's speaking all over America in churches, but also at gatherings where people were talking about abolition and were talking about women's suffrage and, and Sojourner Truth spoke. But when she spoke, she was like a Trojan horse. She came into the congregation, she came in, and she always stood very silently right by the podium. She would sit there and then she would get up and speak, and before she would speak, she'd say, may I speak, may I speak? And she'd ask the person who was in charge of the meeting, and they would nod, yes, you can speak. She was humble. And then she always started her, so her speaking with a song, and she sang, and she was tall. She was a bomb free, a tall woman, and she stood and she sang Amazing Grace and these other great songs, and she sang, 
and people were touched by her singing. And then she told these Bible stories over and over and over again, and she got people laughing. And they were laughing so hard that she would then slip in this little, behind their defenses, this little shot at talking about women's suffrage and, and about ending slavery. And it was so interesting that white slave owners, male white slave owners, came to hear her, and they loved her. And she said, now wait a minute, you love me, you're laughing at me, and they would applaud, and they would say, Sojourner, just sing one more song, just tell us one more story. She'd say, now wait a minute, I was a black slave, is slavery right? And all of a sudden, these white slave owners, oof. And then she'd say, you love me, but I'm a woman, and don't I have the right to vote? And do you know that in one of the gatherings in 1860, Sojourner Truth said, there ought to be equal pay for equal work. Black people ought to be able to make what white people make. In 1860, she said this. And women ought to be able to make what men do. She said, actually, women work harder than men. And she got a standing ovation, and everybody said it. And then she said, it's one thing to give me a standing ovation, it's another thing to act it out. Ooh, they were hit right in the solar plexus. So, do we have another hour, by the way? <laughs> I just want to share with you three spiritual lessons we can learn from Sojourner Truth. They're in the form of three simple questions. I won't be long, I promise. Question number one, have we given our whole lives to Jesus Christ? See, the key to Sojourner Truth is she gave her whole life to Jesus Christ, and no movement could capture her. She was a charismatic, she was an evangelical, she was a social activist, she was an abolitionist, she was involved in the women's suffrage movement, but she was bigger than that because she gave her whole life to Jesus. Have we given our whole life to Jesus? And if not, what are you holding back? Habits, behavior, your temper, anybody procrastinating, career, relationships. Sojourner Truth gave her whole life to Jesus. Have we? Question number two. What's in your lane? Remember, Sojourner Truth's lane was slavery and suffrage. She spoke out of those things because that was her own experience. What is your lane of service? Now, notice the things Sojourner Truth didn't get involved in. She didn't get involved in feeding the hungry. She didn't, it's not that she didn't believe in it. That just wasn't her lane. She didn't get involved in world missions or missions all over the United States. That wasn't her lane. She didn't get involved in Christian education. Not that that wasn't important. That just wasn't her lane. She stayed in her lane and used her name, her influence, her energy, her passion, her oratory to the glory of God. What's your lane? What's my lane? Where does God want you and me to use our name, our influence, to make a difference in society? What's the name of your lane? And third question, are you making any progress in your walk with Jesus Christ? See, Sojourner knew that she would never arrive at fully being a fully sanctified Christian. She was on a journey. And one of the reasons she was so effective in preaching, she realized everybody out there was on a journey too. And so she wasn't trying to be judgmental. She knew if she just spoke the truth to that audience and then let the Holy Spirit change their lives, she'd be a lot better than if she was trying to change them and got mad at them. So she delighted them. She had them laughing and crying and singing and praising God. And she realized that she was on a sojourn and so were they. And she had to help them to take one little step, then another, then another, just like she did to get go of their bad habits and their rage and things that they thought were inbounds that God thought were out of bounds. And what is it that you're doing? What, where are you making any progress in your walk with Jesus Christ? So do this experiment. Think about your life right before COVID, January, February of 2020. Where were you with God then? Where are you with God today? Have you made any progress in your walk with God? If Jesus could say to you, hey, how are you making progress? Do you know me more than you did two years ago? Have you made any progress in these two years? And if Jesus would say, where do you want to be with me in a year or two 
or five? What would you say? Are you making any progress in your walk with God? What's the lane where you're to speak and speak up when you give your whole life to Jesus Christ? So he just closed with this thought that somewhere right now in Hollywood and Westwood and Brentwood and Bel Air, somebody is trying to convince somebody and maybe this week they'll try to convince you that something that they think is in bounds, you clearly know it's out of bounds for God. There's people right now trying to help you to think, okay, these things are in bounds. The NF National Football League not hiring black coaches, that's in bounds. Speaking dirty things about other people, telling racist jokes, telling jokes with a racial slur, or, or putting down somebody's racial ethnic identity, that's in bounds. The question Sojourner would ask us is, do we have the guts to, to speak up and say, no, that, that's not in bounds. That's out of bounds. And what if there's somebody who's drawing a circle in Hollywood or Brentwood or somewhere, drawing a circle that's shutting people out because of their gender, their racial, ethnic identity, or their background, or their political party. They're drawing a circle that's shutting people out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. Do you and God have the wit to win to draw a circle that will take them in? Do we have an opportunity to, to draw the circle bigger in our way of influence? Are we willing to speak up and say something's out of bounds that people say is in bounds? We have the opportunity to draw a bigger circle. If we will do these things, then we will have learned the spiritual lessons of sojourner truth and even more importantly, of Jesus Christ. May it be so, Brentwood Presbyterian Church. Amen. Friends, we are a church that strives to draw the circle wider and wider and wider still. We are a community that journeys together, that disciples together, that seeks the truth of Jesus Christ together. And so now as we take our morning tithes and our offerings, as our ushers come forward, as we hear this beautiful music, this beautiful spiritual from our choir, we are inspired by Sojourner Truth to continue our discipleship journey with Jesus Christ. Come, let us take our morning tithes and our offerings. 